There we go. What's up, guys? I was going to try and do this on my laptop to make it a lot easier. But for some reason, on my laptop, it kept saying that it was blocked. And I could not figure out how to fix it or fix around it. So, we're just going to go with it this way and try not to break everything. But, um, there we go. The main idea I had with this is, one, to give myself some uh, stress relief. Because there's way too much going on right now and a lot of people freaking out. And two, I have absolutely nothing to do now. And wanted to have a little bit of fun. And kind of do a little bit of programming. Uh, pretty much what I'm wanting to talk about is a little discussion on pottery. Both historical and up to modern. So kind of like throughout the years. Hi Brad. <laughs> but um... Basically, the basics of it is we're going to start with kind of like the earliest forms of pottery and how... Turn my vibrate off. There we go. And how it's kind of changed through the years, both pottery itself as an art form and the perception of it. Uh, pottery goes way back, like way, way back. And it's really hard to say when the exact earliest forms of pottery would have been because we found it in you know our native american cultures and not just our native americans but uh, indigenous people all over have artifacts have been found from all sorts of indigenous people with pottery is there no sound oh did i do all that talking and there's not even any sound that's going to be embarrassing Okay, there we go. <laughs> but um, anyway, so indigenous people all over the world, artifacts have been found from all sorts of different cultures with pottery. Now, what's uh, really interesting about that is the perception. Uh, when we're talking about perception, first thing I kind of want to say is when I talk about perception and whenever I talk about pottery, especially historic pottery in general. Um, a guy, Mike Ramsey, that I work with out at Discovery Park gave me a really, really good tool to talk about historical stuff like this. And that is, whenever you're talking about these things, talk about it in the sense that you're that person using this as a tool just to survive, not like some super cool artifact, which they are super cool artifacts, don't get me wrong. But I like to think of it in a way that I'm this person, I'm using this pottery, not just for fun, but for, you know, survival. I need this to, you know, hold like food and water. So we're going to kind of put ourselves in that mindset for a minute. But, um, what is, indi so indigenous people, uh, the short term for that is like your, your Native American type cultures, uh, Aztecs, Mayans, you know, stuff like that, your Ancient peoples is a good way to describe indigenous. But, um, so basically, earliest forms of pottery, literally just seen as tools. They were not seen as art forms or anything like that. Uh, early forms of pottery, especially with our Native American people, literally just survival. Uh, they would make bowls and cups and just throw them away, kind of like we would throw away a Kleenex if we were done using it. Uh, they really didn't care too much about it. It was there to serve a function, and after it served that function, that was it. Now, with that said, whenever we find, especially Native American pottery, some of them that we find, they have, you know, decorations. They do have decoratives. And no, you cannot have that sombrero. I probably should have moved that. But um, they did make decorative pieces. Now, the difference between let's say, a super decorated piece, especially with Native American pottery, compared to, like, you know, the plain, not really decorated pieces that we would also find, is mainly function. So, one thing you got to realize, in Native American culture, their pottery took them a lot 
longer to make because they did not have the tools that we have today. Uh, like modern day pottery, we have the wheels, the spinning wheels that we would make our pottery on. <laughs> Everybody wants the sombrero. Um, and we also have kilns so that we can, you know, fire that pottery up because clay has to get really, really hot for it to harden and even hotter to eventually get a piece like we have here, which we'll use this piece instead because this is the uh, this is earthenware and this is porcelain. They would not have used porcelain then; they would have used earthenware. This is right out of the ground. But they didn't have kilns and they didn't have wheels. They had their bare hands. They had a hole in the ground and they had stuff to set on fire. Am I going to have to move the sombreros? <laughs> but uh, so for them, it took a lot longer. So because of that, they would not heavily decorate a piece that they were going to use all day. And the reason for that, modern day pottery, like this cup right here, we put glaze over it. That's what these colors give, or get rather. These come from the glaze. And what that glaze does is it gives this glass layer over the bare clay and that keeps it from breaking down. If I took just, if I had a piece of pottery, like a cup, that was nothing but this without the glaze on it, I could put liquid in it, but it would eventually break down. Uh, and that's one thing that the Native Americans would find out. Yes, they did make things to hold water, liquids, and, you know, food, but it wasn't very decorated. And because without that glaze, it would eventually just break down, wear out, and they would toss it. They had no more need for it to serve its function. And that's where a lot of pottery shards come from and stuff that they just tossed over their shoulder because they were tired of it. Now, with that said, the decorated pieces that we usually see, especially in museums, those would not always be used. A lot of times those super decorated pieces, again, because they would break down with use, those would be used to bury with somebody, to celebrate somebody. Um, Later on in their period, those pieces would be used for trade, but they didn't serve any real function. That's why there's a little bit of debate and a little bit of discussion over what's the more important pieces, the ones that have all this super cool, colorful decoration, or these play ones that we know were actually used and served a real function. So they wouldn't... Well, here, I'll answer Chad first. Um... I do plan to do that. The problem is the clay that I usually got shipped from China. So I'm trying to find a better, like, closer place that I could get clay. And then I will eventually do that, which here in a minute I'm going to talk about how they made it. As for the glazes, they wouldn't make glazes. They would not make glaze. And the reason they wouldn't make glaze, uh, modern day glazes like this one, this is made from borite, uh calcium something and I don't remember what else I'll have to check my recipe book but this is this is basically chemistry and they wouldn't have access to stuff like that back then the way that they would get their colors um, animal blood they would use fruits and they would make natural dyes with plants uh, for example dandelion soak that in water you're eventually going to get kind of like a yellow but Fruits, uh, natural dyes from plants, and, you know, just whatever they could find. They wouldn't have an actual glaze. Shut up, Brad. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so to touch more on that, a lot of, again, like I said, a lot of time also went into these. And some, they would decorate it a little bit. Don't get me wrong. They would decorate it, but they wouldn't really paint it and put a lot of designs on it. Uh, most of the time, they would just put symbols on it, honestly. And a lot of the symbols are called the friendship symbol, which is the basic arrow and X that we see people get tattoos of all the time. But the reason we say it took them so long to make, we'll go through the steps here. And this is actually a cup. Uh, aside from the glaze, this is one that I made, and this is another one that I made, using the generic, not really generic, but the basic Native American style. Now, the way that they would do it is, first up, they would dig up the clay. And 
clay, it's pretty easy to dig up, honestly. It's pretty easy to find. You find a lot around, you know, water. But they would dig it up, and then they would have to get it ready to actually start, you know, being used. And the way that would happen is after they get it, they have to get it wet. That has to soak up a lot of water, and eventually it's going to turn into not really mud, but mud is a pretty good example to use. My phone keeps slipping, so I wish my computer worked. But it would eventually turn into what looks like mud. After it gets into mud, they would let it sit for just a little bit. And you want to let it sit and kind of treat itself, get rid of some of the other stuff that's in there with it. But basic concept. After that, after they actually have the workable, malleable clay, they're going to do what's called the coil method. And I'm not even going to try to pronounce the proper Native American word for the coil method, but it's exactly what it sounds like. What they would do, and how I made this cup, is they would take their clay, they would kind of knead it like dough to get all the air and excess water out. And then after that, you would roll it, into kind of like a rope. Basically, you're making a rope out of the clay, just like you would at Play-Doh. And then... I, well, I'm glad it has a decent camera. It just keeps slipping. I uh, don't know why my laptop wouldn't work. But um, basically, after they make that clay rope, they would take it, hold it up just like this, so that it's just kind of dangling down. I really wish I had a good example I could use. Ah, I do. One sec. Here we go. So this is going to be our clay rope. But they would hold it like this, careful so that it doesn't break. The end would stay on their solid surface. And then what they do is they just slowly let it fall and coil around itself into a circle, kind of like a snake, like a coiled up snake. After they got kind of like that circle piled up rope, they would usually take two stones, but a lot of times they would just use their bare hands. Uh, and they would just smooth it out, push it together, and smooth it out so that it builds up, gets taller, and makes their end shape. And a lot of times, they wouldn't really make cups. Cups was kind of like, a honestly, a last resort, and they really had no need for them like we do. A lot of times, what they're going to be making, they're wanting stuff so that they can put whatever they need to store to carry from one place to another. Their main concern was storage vessels, especially for food. So a lot of times what they'd be making is vases. They'd be making vases and jars to hold their food. And honestly, a lot of times they wouldn't even really store wet, you know, like wet food. They would mostly store dry food. So like your corn, your rice, you know, nothing wet, mostly just dry. And that's what a lot of their pottery would be used for. And later on, it did become an art form. And one of the main places we see pottery becoming a, you know, mainstream art form is actually in Japan. In Japan, it became a huge art form and a huge industry. And a lot of the methods that we use today, we actually cut from Japan rather than Native Americans. But the Native American method is one of my favorite methods because it's the easiest to learn and one of the most fun to use. But um, Japan is where we see a lot of different types of pottery that became mainstream. And that was mostly in the form of teapots. And this is just a kind of like a little demo piece. It is functional. And this one is also made out of porcelain. Yeah, this is porcelain. But it's a little small. <laughs> but uh, in Japan, they used it mostly as an art form. And they used it as an art form along with enameling. Enameling and pottery was a huge thing out in Japan. And for the most part, it's just because clay out there and the materials that they had and because of the time period, it was a lot more readily available. They didn't have, you know, much competition in that era. But it was mostly used for trade and, of course, their personal uses. So, from start to finish, we'll answer that before I get too far. From start to finish, the Native American process took about a week. It took about a week. And and what took so long wasn't making the piece itself. Making the piece itself, you could get this done and make a vase about the size of this liter bottle. 
You can make one this size probably in about 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, with them, I would want to say probably about an hour just because the clay that we use today, we don't dig out of the ground and have to get it prepared. It's usually prepared right out of the box. They had to take the time to gather it, prepare it, and then get it ready. So I'd say a little bit over an hour. Now, what took the longest part, remember that I said we have a kiln, obviously. Nowadays, they did not have the kiln. So what they would do, and I'm glad you asked that, Elizabeth, because I completely forgot to talk about their method. But what they would do, since they didn't have a kiln, they found that once clay dries out in the sun, it gets harder. And the longer you leave it out, the harder it gets. So what they eventually found, if you burn clay, it gets hard as a rock. So what would happen after they make this finished piece, it would sit out in the sun for a little bit, and they would make what was literally called a pit kiln. They would dig a hole, and the hole, there's no set size or dimensions. The hole would be big enough for however many pieces they need. But they would dig a hole, and then they would line the bottom and the sides of that hole with flammable material. So leaves, straw, Yes, I had just a random bottle sitting next to me. But they would <laughs> they would line the hole with straw, uh, leaves, twigs, sticks, something that's going to stay combustible for a long time. And then they would set down their pottery pieces on that flammable material. And then they would make another layer of flammable material over the pieces and then cover the pit. And usually the pit would be covered with logs. And after that, they just set it all on fire, and leave it there. And they leave it there until the fire pretty much either kills itself or about a week. Um, nowadays, it only takes a day to fire, but the reason it took them so long, our kilns get into the like 5,000 degrees, right? Their little pit fires obviously are not going to get that hot, so it took them a lot longer for it to get finished. So that's the answer to your question, Elizabeth. Yeah, that was a great question. Uh, let's see, while we're still talking about Native American pottery, actually, they didn't just make vases and jars. It actually went a lot more than that because uh, a lot of things that they're known for are making arrowheads. And they didn't make arrowheads out of clay, don't get me wrong there. But their stonework was a huge, huge thing, especially for them. And... Some of the things that they would make is effigies. And this is not, this isn't an authentic one. This is not an actual artifact. This is a replica that I made myself based off of what a Native American effigy would look like. And this is, again, made out of just earthenware out of the ground clay. But they would make these. And what's really cool about effigies is their belief in them. So, Native American religion is a it's an awesome thing to real... Thank you, Elizabeth. Can I tie in the Star Wars t-shirt? No, they didn't. Native Americans didn't have that. There, they did. there is a story that roughly translates to the Star War, but the proper translation for it and the proper name is the Star Hunt and the Longest Hunt. But some translations say the Star War. So that's the only way I can tie in this t-shirt. But anyway... Uh, effigies. What's really cool about Native American religion, if you really look into it, is their spirits that they have. And they would make little effigies like this one to represent a spirit. And what they would do, what's really cool about these, is, and the reason these are considered an artifact, one they're made, but they had a really interesting purpose. So the Native Americans, they traveled a lot. Now, they would find a spot, settle down, and stay there for a while. But for the most part, they're going to be traveling. Ricardo's not going to make appearance. But they're going to be traveling around a lot. And, obviously, they have their three main things they need. Shelter, food, and water. Now, how the effigies, like this little turtle, tie in, each spirit had its own thing. You had the spirits for hunting, you had the spirits for gathering, you had the spirits for water. So, let's say that we're Native Americans, and we are making the effigies that relate to us, for our spirits, that also relate to the resource we really need. So, in my case, I really need water. 
So I come to an area that we're thinking about settling down, and I find a readily available source of drinkable water. What we would do is we would take our effigy, and we would place it inside that water source, because it's our belief that if that effigy is inside that resource that relates to the spirit that that effigy relates to, example, turtles and water, the turtle spirit and the frog spirit, would be with water. So I would place that in the drinking water, and it's my belief that placing it there in that resource is going to channel that spirit, that deity, and that water is going to remain there you know, throughout. It's going to stay readily available and pure so that I can drink it and survive off of it. So that's another really cool thing with Native American pottery is that it doesn't just stop at vases or jars. And yes, this is a one that I made myself. And it also has a design that's often seen in effigies. You can't really see it because this one's really old and it's starting to get kind of worn. But uh, it's basically the sign for like the sun. But moving on. And this is probably going to be the last thing I talk about unless y'all just have questions. But moving on from that. I'll say what Ricardo is later. But moving on from that. Let me get my glove on for this. It also didn't stop at effigies. Because, again, what we have to realize, the earth, the raw earth, is pretty much what they had to work with. And they would also make their instruments. And this is an actual artifact. This is one that was given to me. Let's see if I, there we go. And this is a stone whistle. So, yeah, and this is a, Perugian whistle, Perugian. This is a whistle that was found in Peru as well. But yeah, so a lot of their pottery would feature uh, some kind of animal or spirit. Uh, a lot of them, in fact. And the most popular would be what they kept fish in. A lot of it would have the image of a fish right there on it. So yeah, heaven, a lot of their pottery would be in the shape of an animal because again, it's their belief that's going to channel that spirit. It's good luck. But talking more about the whistle is they wouldn't just make, you know, jars, vases, and effigies. They would make instruments and other little tools like the little stone whistle here. And I'm not going to blow into it just because it is super, super old. The day that I opened it, I did blow into it just because I was really curious, and yes, it does work. But this is just made out of raw stone, and they would do this with clay or just, again, raw stone because that's what they had to work with. So, just another really cool thing that they would do with, you know, clay or just rocks in general. But that's pretty much all I had. I really just wanted to do this to kind of, one, have fun, uh take people's mind off of everything. I'm probably going to do one or two of these a day, honestly. Um, it's not always going to be the same thing. I'm just going to randomly pick up a topic. But y'all can ask any questions you want. If y'all don't have any questions, though, that's pretty much it. And just since everybody keeps asking, that's that right there. That's, that's Ricardo. So, there's that question, Alex. That's one thing that I've been looking into myself. And there's no real way for us to know. Because we can't talk to the people that made it. There's a lot of theories and a lot of discussion behind it. And one story that I did find when I was looking up. Because this whistle... I've been looking into it a lot, and I think it's probably Mayan, but I'm not 100% positive. But um, one story and kind of legend slash myth that I found when I was looking that up myself, how they knew it would work as a whistle. And the story goes back to a traveler. And he was traveling with his son. And there's a few different iterations. Some say, Ricardo's the green dinosaur! But it goes back to an old story. Some say that he's traveling with the sun. Some iterations say that he was traveling with a friend. The point is, it was two people traveling together. And they were walking through a valley. On each side of the valley was a bunch of, you know, just out clips or 
out cliffs. <laughs> Rock formations like cliffs. And they were walking between these two. Just walls. Uh, Elizabeth, I'll answer that question in just a second. But, anyway. Yeah, if you figure out too, Heaven, go ahead and uh, message me. But, just back to the story. According to the story, the two people got separated. And while one of the men was walking by himself in a panic trying to find the other person he was traveling with, one thing he noticed is that when the wind started picking up, and in the story it says that it's a very snaky path, so, you know, kind of picture like that. It's not a straight path. But he noticed that when the wind passed through it, and it would hit those rocks at an angle, it would whistle. And he would follow that whistle, and his companion also apparently followed that sound, and they eventually met up together. Uh, again, that's just a story and a myth. It does not necessarily 100% tie into how they discovered how to make a whistle. But um, that's something I'm going to have to look more into. As for your question, Elizabeth, yeah, no, definitely. Uh, no two pieces of pottery are the same. They all look different. The method behind making it, either pinch pot or coil potting, and, of course, the pit kiln, all those methodologies are pretty much the same. They're uh, pretty much universal. It's just the design and the look and, of course, what they put on that and the location is when you find a lot of those differences. That's when a lot of the differences come into play. But the methods, the fire pit, all that kind of stuff, pretty much universal. There's not many differences. The only time we find real differences is in your Inca tribes, you know, like your Alaskan tribes. That's where you see a lot of differences. And I don't know enough about those kind of peoples to feel comfortable really explaining those differences. I just know that there are differences in those people compared to our Native Americans. And that's mostly just due to area. Man, that was a good question. Uh, did I miss any other questions or do y'all have any more? If not, I'm just going to sit here and stare at myself for a few more minutes until somebody answers. Otherwise, I, that's all I had. But um, this kind of stuff, uh, even if y'all don't ask your questions now, I mean, I love talking about this stuff. So you could shoot me a message and I can answer it there if you don't want to ask it here with everybody else. Um, and I can talk about pottery, not in just Native Americans, but it was in Egypt. Uh, like I said briefly, Japan. It progressed into the modern day. And it, modern era is where it started to become like a huge art form. Uh, we still use it as tools, obviously, but we value it a lot more than they did. Uh, the only other real place, historically, that you find that really valued pottery pieces would be Japan. Uh, Japan, remember I said that they did enameling. And I'll talk about this real quick before I finish up. But remember when I said Japan talked about enameling. Japan, historically and even now, their culture is huge, huge on sentimentality. They're really big on sentimentality. And one of the sentiments is if you get a gift, you know, cherish it. No, don't. Just toss it, break it, give it away, cherish that gift. And with pottery, what we have found, and this even goes on in modern day, they took their enameling art form to pottery. Which, if you don't know what enameling is, basically it's a very minor metalwork. It's mostly used in jewelry. And what they would do is they would melt down. Let's say that I'm in Japan and I break a plate, like a ceramic pottery plate that was given to me and I want to fix it what they would do they would take their enameling skill set and melt down precious metals a lot of historic and ancient Japanese art pieces that you'll find in museums have traces of this and you can look it up too but they would melt down precious metals especially gold and silver and they would use that 
as glue to fill in the cracks and fit the pieces back together. So, yes, they broke something, but they fixed it and they made it even more precious and valuable. And that was a, another, not really form of art, which it is a form of art, but to them it was just, oh crap, I broke this, I got to fix it, and you know, make it even more special, and more valuable. Which you can read a lot more about that online, it's pretty cool. So, I've not really explored different cultures in my own pottery. Uh, my own pottery, I keep pretty basic and just do the normal spin wheel and, you know, generic designs. But what I have kind of toyed with and, you know, pieces like this, which are, these were not done on the wheel. It, you can pretty much tell with this one. This was done with the coil method. This was done with the hand molding or pinch pot method. Uh, both of those are Native American styles. And Native American styles is what I'm most comfortable with. It's what I have researched the most. And it's just what, honestly, I like it a lot more. Um, so definitely that. Those are the different, really, the only culture type I've done. I have a few pieces that are broken. And I do plan on trying to do the style, like with Japan, where you take something, melt it down, and use that as glue. I do want to try that eventually. Uh, I just got to look more into it and get a little better at it. I have done enameling myself, but I'm not comfortable with my skill set putting that towards pottery just yet. So uh, really the only culture I've delved into is different Native American styles. And that's the one I'm best at. It's just generic, on the spinning wheel, you know, <laughs> boring American style. <laughs> But yeah, good question. Anything else? Make sure I didn't miss any messages. It doesn't look like I did. Well, that's all I got. I'm going to make me something to eat and something to drink. Again, uh, keep an eye out. I'm going to be doing one of these probably every day. Uh, again, just to keep my mind off everything, keep everybody else's mind off stuff, and, you know, just find a way to still have fun. Hey, Dr. Smart. I didn't see you join. Um, so, a lot of the materials that we use in glaze are broken down to a powder, and some of those are actual metals. I have not taken, you know, like, actual just metal melted it down and added it to the glaze because that's not something i know enough about i just know that the materials are metals now with that said i have added some really weird stuff to glazes and i do have i don't think it's here i think that piece i might have given to my mom but i do have a piece that i have taken metal after it was already done and put it on there and then covered it with the glaze and the reason I did that is because it leaves this really cool impression, kind of like a stamp. And you can see whatever was on that metal through the glaze. So it just gives a really cool effect. But I've never just taken raw metal, melted it down, and put it in the glaze. Ricardo is not doing his own show. <laughs> but, alright, uh, that's all I got. If y'all have any other questions that you think of, Feel free to message me. Uh, I'll try to figure out what I want to do tomorrow. Again, it's going to be something like this. I just have to decide on a cool topic or fun topic. But um, I'm also going to work on doing something that's more interactive, like more interactive programming just for fun. But, uh, yeah, thank y'all. Uh, hope y'all enjoyed it. If y'all have any more questions, just message me.